chains of bondage over your life. I believe that because I know that it's amazing the testimonies that you all have shared because God is working behind the scenes. He is very interested in your life and what the impact that you will make in this world. You're very interested because he's put things inside you, each one of you, that he wants to bring out. And he will bring it out through circumstances or situations you find yourself in, people you meet, but he will bring it out because he is God. Now today we're going to look at this woman. Yes, last week we looked at David, didn't we? David was an amazing man. Today we're going to look at an amazing woman. Not because I'm a woman, but because God placed her on my heart. So we're going to look at this woman and we're going to look at three passages of scripture. This very first one is something I think is quite familiar to most of you. And it's the passage of scripture in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 to 42. And we're going to read it. As Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. This is in the King James Version, verse 40 onwards. But Martha was encumbered with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. This story is told in the setting of a home in Bethany, a family that, you know, Jesus, you know, Jesus was Jesus, right? The Lord. He was sent down to earth to do, he had his assignment. But there was this family in Bethany that he loved hanging out with them. Why? Because he was comfortable. He could let his hair down, so to speak, and just be himself with this family. Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. They played a great part in his life. You know, whenever he wanted to chill out, just like you have people that you chill out with, (laughs) that you can just be yourself and you know that they love you no matter what. This was a family like that, you know? And They came to Bethany to recharge and the Bible tells us that Martha welcomed them. She didn't just welcome Jesus because he was there with all of his entourage, right? his holding bank and she welcomed him into her home. This was her home. Now can you imagine, right? What happens when you welcome people into your home? There's a lot of adjustments that need to take place, right? A lot of preparation that needs to go on and this is what had to happen for Martha because she's a very conscientious hostess. She invites somebody into a home, everything must be perfect. No roti chanai, nothing. This, did you see what it says? She was busy preparing a big dinner, not a small makan, not tea time. Okay, this is a real fest, feast that she wanted to prepare. And that's fine because she was a very generous hearted woman. But what happened? Because she had decided, I'm going to prepare this dinner. What happened? (laughs) She began to get a little bit frazzled, right? (laughs) Anybody been in that place? Oh my God, I got so many things to do. I got to sort this out. I got to sort that out. (sighs) I got to get somebody to help me. And of course, she was waiting for her sister to help her, right? Very common in that culture. Women are supposed to be in the kitchen, taking care of household things. So she's chopping up the onions and whatever not, and she's waiting for Mary. And what happened? Mary, where's Mary? Have you seen Mary? Where's Mary? She goes about and what happens? The chances on Mary. What's Mary doing? Just a bit too much, isn't it? Mary is basically relaxing. 
while she is running herself off her feet. So she, Mary, Mary, come here, Mary. She's trying to get Mary's attention, but can she get Mary's attention? Mary's eyes are focused on something that is very important to Mary. And Martha can't get Mary's attention. So what does she do? Now, just I ask you a question first. Is what Martha doing wrong? Is what she's, what she's doing, is it wrong? What has she done? She's opened her home. Isn't that wonderful? Generous, open-hearted. She's cooking a big dinner for her guests. Isn't that great? She's using her skills. She's a fantastic cook, I'm sure. Using her skills to bless people, right? What more? This, this is not just people. It's Jesus, right? She wants to bless him. She wants to serve him. Is there? There's nothing wrong with what she's doing. In fact, we would think there's everything right in what she's doing. This is what we want all the Christians to do, right? Go and serve. Do what you can for those people out there. You know, but what has happened to her because of what she's doing? Is she in the right place? She's anxious, she's upset, she's worried. Anybody there at the moment or been there? We all know what it's like to be in Martha's place. Really upset about what's going on in her life through the choices that she's made. So she does exactly what, you know, there's somebody there who can solve the situation, right? She goes straight to him. And what does she say? Don't you care? Funny question, right? Do you find yourself asking the Lord that? When we are in that place which we are in because of our own choices. Was it Martha's choice to cook the big dinner? Nobody asked her to cook it. Did Jesus say, I need a big dinner? No. She decided, I'm going to cook a big dinner for Jesus. Right? I've got to show him what I can do. She was where she was as a result of her own choices and yet she comes to him and says you don't care about me you know I'm in this place don't you care big accusations going on don't you care doesn't it seem unfair what's unfair you decided to cook a dinner so what's unfair is my sister has left me to serve alone she just sits here while I am doing all the work is basically, you know, she doesn't just come to Jesus to tell him of her situation. What else does she say? Tell her to come and help me immediately. Right? Do you come to Jesus like that? You know, I got this situation. Can you please sort it out? Make sure that person comes and does whatever. whatever doing that to God. We don't realize that we are in that place often. Martha, the word Martha, her name actually means mistress, lady of the house or boss in other words. So she's bossing Jesus around as well and she waits for Jesus to give it to Mary good and proper and what happens? Does the, what comes out of Jesus is something I don't think she expected. What would you have expected? Basically it's like, you know, you're in your house preparing a big dinner and somebody you know, and um, the people who are designated to help you are sitting down and talking to the guests while you are in the kitchen lah, chopping up the food and everything. <laughs> right? It's a situation that makes you fuming mad. But Jesus says, Mary, you've had enough of listening now. Get up and go. Does he do that? Wouldn't you expect him to do that? Is that the right thing to do, isn't it? I mean, I'm hungry now. Go cook the food for me. Go. <laughs> Not at all. Martha, Martha. He does, he says, you are anxious and troubled, worried and upset over many things, over all these details. But, what does he say? One thing is needful. One thing. You are troubled about many things, but... One thing is needful. Today, when you guys shared your testimonies, and when Jer Jerry shared his testimony as well, and you know what he said, when God is working at the background, there is only one thing needful, and it is your belief. It is not your service. Oh, cannot. We, I mean, God called us to serve, isn't it? Yes and no. 
You got to get the right perspective on things. And the last time I spoke, I talked about getting God's perspective. Jesus' perspective was very weird, right? Again, he's scold, not he's not scolding Mary. In fact, he scolded Martha. What did he say? Mary has chosen the good part. She has chosen the one thing needful. If only we hear and listen to what Jesus is saying, because we don't. Because for us, many things are needful. We've got to take care of our family. We've got to make sure the office is running well. We've got to organize our lives, marry somebody good, get the proper children, put them in the right schools, etc., etc., etc. Leave a good heritage for our family. We've got many, many, many things that we are concerned with. And yet Jesus says, only one thing is needful. What is that one thing? I ask you. What is that one thing? Because we got to get this. If there is only one thing needful, isn't it imperative that we get it? What the one thing is? What was it that Mary did? You know, many times people share this scripture and say, you know, Martha was the real go-getter, active type. Like, that's why she was like that. Martha, uh, Mary is very contemplative. You know, she thinks about things. You know, that's why she was sitting where she was. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, Jesus said, Mary has chosen... Mary has chosen the good part. Mary has chosen. It is a matter of choice. The title of my message today is Choose You This Day. Choose You This Day. Choose You This Day. What did Mary do? She sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said, what he taught. What does sitting imply? You guys are all sitting and relaxing now, right? Anybody sitting like this? Not really sitting? When you're sitting, what are you relying on? The chair to hold you up. Are you relaxed? Are you relaxed, Mike? <laughs> relaxed. You're, you're not concerned that the chair will break. Most of us don't worry about that. We're just sitting down and we're relaxing. And that was what Mary was doing. The Bible tells us that she was in a... Sitting means being in a position where your weight is supported. What does the Bible tell us? Underneath are the everlasting arms. Who is supporting you? Do you know? Are you supporting you? Is your business running because of your efforts? Because if you believe that, then you have not chosen the one thing needful. Because there is only one thing needful. It is to rest. Rest on what? She was sitting at Jesus. She understood what this verse meant. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What? You mean he's just telling us to relax? You mean Christian life is just a matter of relaxing? Uh? I don't know. Let's find out whether it is just a matter of relaxing, twiddling our thumbs. Was that what she was doing? Was that what Mary was doing? She was resting. She was sitting. Now this word, sitting, where was she sitting? Not next to Jesus. Where was she sitting? Next to Jesus would imply that she was sitting Right, I mean, equal to him. She was sitting at his feet, the Bible tells us. Sitting at his feet. Sitting at his feet. This word in Greek is parakathizo. Parakathizo is a Greek verb which means not just to sit, but to sit very near, as close as possible as you can get. That was how she was sitting. As close as she could get. Nobody was closer than she. Sitting at the feet of someone also means that you are their disciple. You're learning at their feet. Just like Paul, Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel, he says. That means I was a disciple of Gamaliel. She sat at Jesus' feet. Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And the Bible tells us again, that is the one thing needful. The one thing needful is being close to him. Now there are many, uh, many theologians will say, this is the first step Okay? 
they will tell you this is the first step and then you can move on to the next steps i want to declare to you this day that is the only step sitting at the feet of jesus listening to what he tells you is the only step why because when you do that whatever when you do that whatever you do your life will be lived as an outcome of whatever you are hearing you will do things that may give you a claim great acclaim or may give you great scorn do you remember david what did he do he danced practically naked in front of his whole kingdom right i want to tell you that one thing needful is the only thing it is not the first step then the next step and the third step and the fourth step it is the only thing what did she sit at his feet and do was she thinking about the next thing she has to sort out what's for lunch and all that what was she sitting at his feet and doing she was only she was listening she was listening with all of herself she was giving her full attention and focus to jesus that's why when martha was gesturing to her Mary, she couldn't see martha she couldn't care less and i want i want you to see this is a characteristic of mary she couldn't care less what anybody around her thinks she could care less that's a bit much isn't it you think i mean we are christians we must care isn't it what society thinks and all that so it's a little bit uh, i don't know whether this is right i just want you to keep an open mind when you shut you cannot hear keep an open mind and see for yourself what the bible shows us about this woman all right so she sat at the feet and listened now this ver was uh, this verb listen in this phrase is a continual listening and hearing process she listened with full attentiveness you know that means she wasn't looking elsewhere while listening she wasn't you know have you ever had the situation you're having one great you know pouring out your heart to somebody and then a phone call comes and the person takes the call not just takes the call answers and all that you know the message comes in answering the message how does that make you feel it just stops you short isn't it in your your pouring out of your heart this was not how she was listening she listened with all of herself and and i want to tell you give you another example imagine if the agong were to walk here into this you know like mike was saying when you did your presentation it has to be immaculate isn't it no problem not everything must be perfect you know imagine if the agong were to walk here will we carry on with our program i don't think so i think we'll quickly find out what it is that he wants how come he's here is he here to attend the service okay fine then we carry on all right first we give him a drink of water whatever find out exactly what he needs we'll be we'll assign somebody to sit next to him just in case he coughs and he needs something right we are so attentive to our earthly rulers yet in this household where martha was who was the only person who was listening to jesus wasn't he talking i mean the king of kings is speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking and only one person thought that that was more important than the household duties attending to everybody else in the home it was only mary who chose the one thing needful and i want you to see as we look at her life that it brought a she, there's a great difference between Mary and Martha and every other disciple all right because she paid her full attention to who Jesus she listened to Jesus was she telling him her, her opinion you know Jesus that day you were telling you know you commanded the fig tree yeah? it's not very nice isn't it to do such things a poor fig tree give it a chance was she giving her opinion about things adding her views having a discourse no she was not she was only listening very hard for us you know all of us i'm sure i'm number one when my husband says something i'll jump up in my opinion i go into a situation straight away i talk 
I give my opinion immediately because my opinion is the most important opinion, obviously. Right? That's how we all behave. We spend very little time listening to find out, okay, what's going on here before we shoot from the hip lah, as per usual. You know? But Mary listened. And Mary listened to the King of Kings. You know, she was... Martha was like the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman sitting at the well, what did she ask? Jesus asked, she was, he was just provoking a conversation and said, ask for water, right? And then she said, are you thirsty or whatever not? And then what did he say? If you only knew who it is who stands before you, you will ask him for water that you will never thirst again. The fount of living water was standing right in front of the well. The bread of life was sitting right in Mary, Martha's home. She was busy trying to feed him. When it was actually, if she would only feed on him, she would never be hungry again. John 8.35 tells us, if you will only feed on me, you will never be hungry again. She called him Lord, but who was the only one who behaved as if he was Lord? Mary. That's the story of Martha and Mary as an introduction to these two women. Now we're going to go to another passage of scripture. Why I want you to see is because Mary chose the one thing needful. Her life was very different. And this passage is in Mark 14 verse 1 to 9. This passage is repeated in Matthew and in John. And in John, John 11 verse 2 identifies this Mary. Because there are quite a lot of Marys in the Bible, right? This Mary as the same Mary you just met. Mary of Bethany. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. What did she do? She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. And the money given to the poor. And what did they do? They rebuked her harshly. They rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Anybody else in the Bible you know of who received such a commendation? No one. Nobody. This was one woman who because she chose the one thing needful, she knew. She knew what to do. Why I tell you this? Because Jesus had been telling his disciples over and over, I'm going to be killed. They are going to kill me. I will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will, you know, they will flog me and hurt me and kill me. And then I will rise again on the third day. He didn't speak in parables. Sometimes we think they didn't know. Like, that's why it was such a shock to them. No. He told them again and again. Read Mark. In Mark 8, tells you clearly. In Mark 10, again. And the Bible says, Jesus spoke plainly about his death. Like sometimes he speaks in parables so we don't know what he's talking about, right? This time he spoke plainly. So they knew he was going to die. Yet, one woman came. One woman thought, he's not gonna, is he not going to be, I don't really, is he not going to be with me again? Forever will I not see him? And she thought to herself, what can I do? You know, in, in the Bible, it talks about, you know, in those days, Parents would give their daughters uh, this box or jar of very expensive uh, perfume. 
and it says that it's one year's wages is very, very expensive. And it is something that's part of the dowry. It's actually to be broken or used on the wedding night. So this was like the most important thing that she had. What did she choose to do? I am going to give this to the one who means everything to me. I'll do it in private. No. It wasn't easy for her to do what she did. There were no women there. They were having a, you know, a man-to-man -man discussion, lah, as usual. Right? <laughs> Just the men were there. And she actually was not welcome in that place. Worse still, she did something so, I mean, sit quietly at the background and listen to what he has to say. No, goes right in the front. She breaks the alabaster jar. She could have just opened the lid and used a little bit of perfume, right? She broke it. Why did she break it? To show Jesus, I'm not going to use this on anybody else. You are worth everything. My everything I give you. And I don't care what people say. They really... They gave it to her. The Bible says they rebuked her harshly. Who do you think you are? They didn't wait for Jesus to say anything. They thought they knew better and they scolded her. You know, shouted at her. And they would have told her, get out of here. This is not your place. Right? Jesus said what? In modern English, shut up. Paraphrase. Yvonne paraphrase version. He said, shut up. Leave her alone. And I tell you today, if you choose the one thing needful, your God will rise up and shut the mouths of your enemies around you. He will shut the mouths of people around you who are rebuking you harshly, who are speaking ill against you. He will do it for you because Jesus did. Not only did he do that, what did he say? He commended her. Why? Because she was the only one who could tell the times and the seasons. Did anybody else know even though Jesus spoke to them plainly? Jesus said, I'm going to die. Did anybody else do what she did? He says, she has done a beautiful thing for me. She is anointing me for my burial. I, re I tell you and I declare to you, if you choose the one thing needful, you will know the times and the seasons. You will know when it's time to keep quiet, when it's time to do something, when it's time to start this church, when it's time to do something different. You will know. You will know. Because if you choose the one thing needful, that person, that man that you are following is carving the path out for you. He is your shield and your protector. He is your fortress. He is your guide. You know, so, I mean, I, I am just awed at Jesus, what he said. Wherever the gospel is preached, today, 2,000 over years later, we are talking about this one woman. We are declaring what she has done. Because Jesus said nobody is like her. Nobody knew like her. I want to be like Mary of Bethany. I want to know the times and the seasons and not put my foot in my mouth, say the wrong things at the wrong time, do the wrong things at the wrong time. I want to be just, happen to be, I will be in the right place at the right time because I am choosing the one thing needful. I tell you, Jesus will cause some, you don't have to network like you say. You don't have to, you know, it will happen. Just like that hot knife cutting through butter. When God is working for you, you can relax and rest. You really, really can. If you choose the one thing needful, I want to tell you, I don't want to have the perspective of this world. I don't want to be the person looking at what someone is doing that is beautiful, that is lovely to God and say, what a waste of time. What are they doing that for? So stupid. That's basically what the disciples said. I want to have the eyes that can see what God is doing and know the right time, the right place, you know. And this same Jesus, I want to tell you, is the same Jesus. Yesterday, today, and forever the same. The same God that Mary uh, followed after is the same God we are following after today. And as, G as, um, as uh, Jerry preached last week, this is the same God whose eyes are searching to and fro the whole earth. And what is he looking out for? To show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Mary didn't care what the whole world can think because she only had eyes for Jesus. 
because of that, she pleased him so much. I tell you, she pleased him so much. And for our final passage of scripture, I want you to see the difference between the reaction that Mary's words evoked as compared to others. All right? And this is the passage of scripture about Lazarus. In John chapter 11, verse 17 to 37. Lazarus had died. Right? Setting the scene, Lazarus had died. Jesus goes to Bethany. Right? In the eyes of the sisters, both of them, it's too late. Isn't it? Martha hears that Jesus is there. She runs out of the house. They are grieving in the home. All right? It's a very painful, sorrowful time because they love their brother. And he, she runs to Jesus. And what does she say when she sees him? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have... What does Jesus say? Believe on me. He will rise again. He has a dialogue with her. And he tells her, he will rise again. I am the resurrection and the life. If you will believe in me. Jesus was trying to get Martha to a point where he could do something on her behalf. That's what we are saying. It is not important. What does the devil want you to do? Focus on your works. What I do, what I do, what I don't do, my performance. What does God want to focus on? Believe in me, your faith in me. Rest on that because I've done everything. I've done it all. But look, he has a conversation with Martha. And this is really funny. If you read this, script, this passage of scripture, you'll find that Martha decides, okay, I'm not getting anywhere with Jesus. I'll go back to the house. And she calls Mary. The Lord is asking for you. Actually, the Lord never asked for Mary, okay? He, she just finished the conversation and she just told one story, like, basically. Why do you think Martha did that? Any idea? I think that Martha knew that Mary somehow had a secret. Somehow she could push the right buttons with Jesus, right? Somehow. So she tells Mary, you know, no. The Lord is here. So Mary immediately gets up out of that house of grieving and goes. And everybody follows her because they think she's going to the grave to mourn there for her brother. She goes and she sees Jesus and the Bible tells you Jesus had not moved from the same, he was at the same place where Martha met him. And Mary says, have you ever noticed this in the Bible? She says exactly the same thing. The same words. Not something different. Exactly the same words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 21 and verse 32, exactly the same. Only a different person is speaking. And a different heart is speaking. Why? Because God could see, Jesus could see that heart that was fully committed to him. No dialogue, nothing. Only action. Immediately what happens? Jesus was moved and troubled in his spirit. And what did he do? He immediately said, where have you lain him? He goes and he tells him, move the rock. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Do you want to evoke this kind of response from your God or the Martha response? I want God to show himself strong on my behalf. When my heart is fully committed to him, I know, I know that God will come through the same, exactly the same way as Mary did. Because there was no difference in what they said. But the response is so utterly, completely opposite. I want to be at that place where I rest. I know God, you will come through for me. I will do exactly what you want me to do. And I don't care what the world will say. And let me tell you, I am preaching to myself. Because why? I do care what the world says. Many times. Many times. I don't do what I know God is prompting me to do. Because I'll, what will people think? They'll think I'm mad. You know, what's going to happen to my, you know, my uh, clients? They'll think I'm cuckoo. This is not the place or time. Right? This is not the place or time. I'm studying now. Like, come on. No. I want to come to that place that Mary was. And I know that the one thing needful for us to do is to choose the one thing needful that Mary chose. 
Nobody else received that commendation. You know, so the same God, I urge, I tell you, the same God that responded to Ruth. Do you remember what Ruth said? Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She chose to fully commit herself to that one God. She chose. And just the same, God responded to her. The Bible tells us that no Moabite is actually supposed to stand in the congregation of the righteous. And yet, she's a Moabitess, correct? Ruth? And in whose lineage do you find her name mentioned? Jesus. Can you imagine? Somebody is not supposed to be there. She is in the lineage of Jesus because she committed herself completely and totally to the one God. You know, G David is the same. He gave God extravagant worship. Extravagant worship. And God came through for David, the adulterer, the murderer. You know, this fellow is a crook. He really is. <laughs> but in the eyes of the world. But God came through for David because his heart was sold out. Sold out, la, basically. Who are you sold out to? That is the question today, you know. I just, I pray that God will break from us the fear of men and fill our hearts with his fear. You know, I want to declare to you this day, if you choose the one thing needful, when you choose Jesus as your number one priority, when you choose to enjoy Him, to love Him and adore Him, you will find everything else falls into place, you know. He will show Himself strong on your behalf. I just want to call out the Marys within you, the Marys that are in you, that you will come and respond and say, God, I declare this day, I choose this day to follow you completely, wholeheartedly, because I want you to come through for me, just like you did for Mary. Lord, I just want to pray for your people this day, oh God. You know every one of our situations. You know where we are, oh God. You know where our hearts are. You know the things that hold us back. This day, oh God, I ask that you break the chains, the bondage. will be sold out for you, oh God. That our lives and our hearts and everything in us will be sold out, oh God. Our whole complete being will be sold out to you, Lord. Lord, I just declare this over your people this day, oh God, that you will cause them, oh God, you will cause them, oh God, to yearn and long after you, oh God, that their hearts will only seek your pleasure, your will, oh God, in Jesus' name.